Up next, we have our final, uh, our final keynotes. Um, I'm sure you all, well, you all saw, hopefully, you all saw Pietrus's lightning talk um, yesterday, so you've had a little bit of a, um, a sort of taste of, um, of the quality of talk um, that we're hopefully going to be in for. Um, Pietrus has been, well, uh, speaks of himself um, as a, a software, software mechanic, um, presumably contrasting that with kind of um, an, an engineer. And I think all, as software developers, we often all feel more like mechanics than, than like engineers. We often f sort of find ourselves kind of um, in the depths of some function with a spanner, <laughs> wondering why we're covered in grease <laughs> um, and lying on our backs on the skateboard. Um, cool. Um, Pietrus has been doing software for a long time uh, and brings a lot of experience and a lot of interesting ideas. Um, and today he's going to be speaking to us about managers and diplomats, or diplomats and gaskets, and on being the seal that holds teams together. Um, thank you, Pietrus. Thank you, Simon. Murder, Bicon. As you're not wakker. Yes. Are you guys okay? Yes, it's been a long day. I know I'm the last person between you and the beer, so I'll try and make this the quickest 40 minutes or so you've ever been through. Right, so how's it? My name is Pietrus, Pietrus Tron. I'm from Cape Town. I am an amateur musician and a professional programmer for the last 15 years, almost exclusively doing startups. But can I say I'm a masochist? And I like uh, melodic progressive techno. You know, that, that doof doof music? Yeah, that's my jam, you know? They say uh, uh, people love the music that tells the story of, our lives, of their lives. So yeah, like I've built like a lot of stuff. Um, and it's, I think it's relevant to the talk. Uh, last time I was here, 2013, I was talking about building a domain registrar in Python. It was called My Names, uh, now mostly defunct. Uh, I ran an online music store called Rhythm Music Store from 2006 to uh, 2012. I sold some software to a company called iFix. That's now WeFix. I ran the company. And I, I built a failed traffic fine reduction service. I also worked in uh, on-demand insurance for a, a branded a company called Yashua, mobile customer feedback. And I got in trouble for uh, messing around with peer-to-peer -peer DC++ at Stellenbosch. We had a lot of fun with that, as well as uh, automated telephony. But nowadays, mostly, I, I care about uh, volume control. So this is my current endeavor, Wallfly, which is a smart volume control system that measures the loudness at your party or your house, your conference, and uh, feeds it into a little control system, and then it controls the volume so that you and I can have a conversation. So a bit of embedded like circuitry, and I'm finally getting a bit of an ROI on my engineering degree. Right, so today is, <laughs> there's not really any Python in this talk, and <laughs> I hate to disappoint you guys, but I'd like to take you on a, a mind safari to explore some ideas for retaining wealth as we usher in the fourth industrial revolution. Right, in the last industrial revolution, we had this huge move towards centralization, people moving to cities, building factories, big factories where everything was produced, and uh, I feel like almost the opposite is happening today. And we're doing pretty good right now as developers. Our salaries are high. I think we're good for the next 10 years. I don't know what's going to happen in the next 15 or 20 years because we, if you watched Alex Conway's talk yesterday, his keynote, I mean, these, these neural nets are getting pretty good. And I asked myself, what can I do to defend like, myself against the oncoming AI apocalypse? Like, what can I do to remain valuable? Uh, what skills do I need to build? What ideas do I need to marry to remain relevant? So what do I mean by wealth? I think most people don't understand wealth. Uh, wealth is whatever people want. Money is just a proxy for wealth that is easily denominable so that we can exchange wealth. Okay, if you had a machine that could print anything that you wanted on demand, you would be infinitely wealthy and you would have no need of money. So like the Buddhist principle, which is that life is suffering, and that suffering is therefore undeniable, <laughs> conversely, wealth or desire is undeniable. So whatever people want, and that's why Y Combinator, which is an incubator in the States, I think that's why they're 
mantra is to build something that people want. All right, so this is sort of an overview of uh, the talk. Volume good at the back? Yes? Uh, I, I broke it up into six chapters. Uh, we're going to talk a little about uh, the most important trend that I'm seeing, which I call the move to the edge of glory, uh, localism, or islands of knowledge. Nassim Nicholas Taleb he introduced the word localism, which is when systems that work at the micro level do not completely break down at the macro level. Like uh, socialism works great in your family, not so good uh, uh, when you're dealing with a, a big city where you can't trust anyone. Uh, big rockets, diplomats' gaskets, why autistic people rock themselves, tele telescopes and transistors, and some areas that I'm studying to try and stay ahead. Uh, like I don't, I don't think you should tell people what to do, you should tell people what you're doing. Like Don't tell me your, your favorite stock, show me your portfolio. All right, so what I mean by this trend of moving to the edge of glory. Like, I like Lady Gaga. She's got a great song on Howard Stern where she performed it. In the last um, Industrial Revolution, you had all the centralization. And now uh, things are moving to the edge. Even in IoT and cloud computing, you always you got to move to the edge, whether it's CloudFront or Google. Uh, what I mean is that... <sighs> You used to go to a big room in the university and rent out a timeshare computer, right? And now you have a personal computer in your pocket uh, that interfaces with some cloud computer. And then tomorrow you will have a personal super supercomputer on your wrist. That's like sort of moving towards the edge. Okay? So this is what it looks like, going from a centralized architecture to like decentralized, pulling apart these logistical components and then finally moving some kind of processing all the way to the edge. Now, this is, remember, this is not a talk about crypto at all, but that is one example of this. In the energy domain, used to buy power from ESCOM. They couldn't deliver it very well. So now we're installing a home and uh, wind and solar in our homes. Tomorrow, we'll be carrying around supercapacitors, or we'll have a personal fusion reactor in our pocket. We used to farm manually picking strawberries. Now we have combine harvesters. Tomorrow we'll have vertical container farming for every family or neighborhood or individual. Right, so this idea of islands of knowledge. In an ever increasingly specialized world, things are getting, the domains are getting so deep, like you, it will consume your entire life just to study music, for example. People, and people do spend their lives studying music. And I don't just mean like domains like, uh, like English or Mandarin, like languages. I mean like ways of thinking, like manufacturing or economics or geometry, or even just in math alone, there are so many domains that you can focus just on pure mathematics. So as our expertise deepens, these islands, which you can visualize like, as islands of knowledge separated by large swaths of ocean, are growing ever further apart. And even though they are connected by a shared primordial landmass that will be something like geometry or topology or pure mathematics, it's so deep, it's so, so far away, it's not relevant to those of us trying to survive on the surface. So you want something a little bit more, more closer to you. And what I'm seeing in this trend is that if these islands are going further and further apart, then the edges connecting them become more exponentially more valuable. So you have this phenomenon where you have to compete. You have to become hyper-specialized. Right? You have to be a native on this island, and you have to spend your whole life working on leather or writing code, but if you want to build a competitive product, you have to get a bunch of islands to get them to work together or to form a supply chain so that you can, uh, you can build a product. So essentially, the sparser the graph, the more valuable the edges. And as a side note, you can think of an API as a political boundary that has some life cycle and semantic encoding wrapped up in it. Right, so in large graphs, the mobility dominates. And there is this idea in graph theory called centrality, which is a measure of which nodes or edges in the graph are the most central to the graph. And I think this will be relevant later. Like if you're trying to figure out how to 
be valuable in the graph is try and occupy or visit some of these places, or better yet, facilitate the trade between them, become the edge. So Alan Kay has this great quote, which is, for important messages, we do not send an ambassador, we do not send an envelope, we send an ambassador, okay? Now, I really like this quote, but it always bothered me. It took me three years to figure out what was wrong with it. Like, if you think about what an ambassador is, like, think like a brand ambassador, or even worse, like an Instagram influencer. <laughs> They're the furthest possible thing from the business that you're trying to negotiate with. They're just the front. They're an emissary, right? The problem with an ambassador is they only speak one language, and <laughs> it's uh, typically French, right? And what do they say? When they arrive in your, in your land, something like, nice place, I'm taking it, you know? There's, there's no negotiation there, not to hate on the French too much, you know? So ambassadors, they're just the, the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. So that's the definition of an ambassador. What you want is something else. If you want to negotiate, if you want to trade between these two tribes living on very distant islands who don't really speak the same language, they don't even like each other, they have completely different cultures. What you want is someone who speaks two or more languages, with a leg in two lands, someone who is flexible, someone who can initiate the right protocol, someone who can speak to both sides. What you want is a diplomat. A diplomat has some characteristics that are different from an ambassador. Firstly, they'll never be a native. They'll never be a specialist. They can never be as good at doing the thing that the native specialist who's living on that island is doing. So they'll always be a bit of a nomad. Like, they'll never be too at home. They can't, they'll have to live out of a suitcase, travel light, and they'll have to speak multiple languages. So very much a generalist rather than a specialist. And they'll, and they'll always speak with an accent. All right, so going back to the supply chain idea, let's say you wanted to build a big rocket, as we do. How do you do it? Well, really big rockets are so big that you can't fit the rocket in one warehouse. So you have to construct it in pieces, because the pieces also have to be transported on a truck. And this is how like, the Saturn rockets and the Apollo rockets were, were sized. Like, how long is the truck? That's how long each piece is. And then you have to assemble each of these pieces on site. But there's a problem, because the pieces don't line up perfectly, because they were made in different factories, the thermal conditions were different, and even if they were perfect, like it wouldn't be a good seal. Right? It, wouldn't, it wouldn't keep out the vacuum of space and keep some pressure vessel contained, whether that's fuel or oxygen. So what do you do? How do you hold these parts together? Well, you need something in between. And we have a term for this in mechanical engineering. It's called a gasket. It's something that is really thin, because you don't really want it to be there. It's as thin as possible. But it can be no thinner... It can be no thinner than the error tolerance between the two parts. It has to be a little bit elastic. If it was made from the same material, well, now you'd need two gaskets, right? So it's usually coated with rubber. It has to have, it has a very specific property that I think makes it completely distinguish it from the individual parts. Each part has no knowledge of the other parts, but the thing in the middle, this gasket, the seal, has to have knowledge of both sides. You can't just pop rivet the two rocket pieces together. It has to have little holes for it. And you have sea gaskets all over the place. Every one of your cars, if you drove here, has a gasket. And if you hear the head gasket when you know you're in trouble. You might ask, can you make a, an engine out of a single block of metal? Yes, you can. But they uh, cannot be disassembled. They can't be maintained, and they're more expensive to make. And now you have to make all of the stuff on one, one island. You have to specialize in two things. So you'll always see engines in two or three parts or more. 
And rockets indeed have these gaskets, they're a specific kind called O-rings, which are just a toroidal gasket, shaped like a donut. And when they go wrong, they go wrong really bad. We all know what happened to the Challenger. All right, so good gaskets, they're elastic, they're thin, and they know something about two sides. So a diplomat is a bit like a gasket. Right? And so I, I like this analogy. And I think it's a, a valuable way to, like, a line of thinking, to try and discover interesting analogies, because it implies that maybe, like, it might not be perfect, but maybe there's some other interesting properties that we can discover. Right, so what, is this, what does this mean for me? What should I be doing? Well, if you buy into this idea that uh, the world is getting more specialized and the edges are more valuable, you should try to be a gasket, right? You should try to be a negotiator, a diplomat, more than you should be a specialist. And that you should be a good API or a good interface between people and tribes. And you can ask yourself, what, what is that? What is a good API? Well, it's one that has good, always works, <laughs> has a good response time. It can handle all kinds of protocols. Like, it can give me the semantic encoding that I want. Uh, it has back pressure. It tells me when it can't handle any more because otherwise it just fails silently. I think it's useful to think about like, things in this way. Right, but it's still very, it's still very uh, metaphysical. So if you want to survive in this world, I'll give you the strongest model that I know for understanding the world, which is that your prefrontal cortex, which is the most modern part of your brain, is a simulator, and it is constantly predicting what is, going to happen, what is going to happen next. Like even now, you have certain expectation of what I'm going to do, right? And when I do something out of the ordinary, you'll find yourself paying a little bit more attention, right? So your prefrontal cortex is predicting and monitoring, and when something happens that's out of the ordinary, it triggers an anomaly. It refocuses your visual system to gather more information about the anomaly so that it can rationalize the, uh, the stimulus, okay? But what happens when the stimulus contradicts your model? People get very upset, right? When something happens that you didn't expect, like if you're sitting in a bar and a glass breaks, you've never been to a bar before, you'll be alarmed. But after a while, you know it's part for the course. Oh, yeah, it's just a drunk guy, broke a glass, no problem. Right? But when you violate people's expectations, they will get very upset. In fact, they'll get more upset by when their expectations are violated, when things don't go the way they expect, than whether or not things go badly or well. Right? And this explains why managing expectations is so important in project management. And you're, you're not just managing one guy's expectations, you're managing two sides' expectations. So you have to have a model of that guy's model to prevent him you know, getting upset. And you'll see this when, it, when a toddler drops their toy, their favorite toy, they'll start crying, they'll have a tantrum before they've developed a model of gravity. Oh, okay, the cup falls, my toy falls, it's fine, I can pick it up again, I'm gonna be okay. And this is why autistic people rock themselves. So autistic people are hyper-focused on the local and they have a hard time abstracting in certain areas. So if, if, you, have, if you have a severely autistic person in the room, they leave the room and you move their cup and they return, it's a whole new room for them, right? And that is, that's pretty hectic. Like the bottom of your world falls out. So why do uh, people rock? To create a signal that they can predict. And this is why you can rock a baby to sleep. So if you want to be like a you know, productive member of society and a good teammate, you want to be predictable in a way. Right? So you don't want to be too crazy out there. But if you're too predictable, then you're also vulnerable. Because if you can be modeled, then you can be exploited. So people want you to be predictable in certain ways and pleasantly surprising in other ways. They don't want you to pull the rug out from under them but in the right context, they like a little dirty joke over a beer. You know? they, want, they want you to push out and explore the edges of their understanding very gradually. And as we get to know each other a bit better, 
as we share of a variety of contexts in which we are uh, perhaps increasingly more vulnerable, this is why people get drunk together, I realize that I don't need to assign so much bandwidth to figuring out if you're an existential threat to me. My visual system can relax. And when we, we have enough case history for, f for that, we can turn our backs to each other and cooperate. And now we can start to address external problems in the environment instead of being so concerned with our internal strife. And it's also why internal po political strife is so disruptive for companies uh, servicing consumers. So the worst thing you can do to someone is to, you can get them to trust you for like a long time and then you betray them. And so if, if, like if you see this, like if, if someone's been dating for five years and someone cheats on them, what they thought the last five years were facts, they stop. They have no idea where they are in the world. They don't even know where to turn because what they thought were facts were not and they have to relive everything that happened until they know where they are in the world, sort of by dead reckoning. And I think this is why lies are so untenable, because you only have a limited amount of processing bandwidth, like CPU memory-wise, and if I tell you a lie, you have to extrapolate all the possible futures of what's really happening and what you told me could have happened, and you will run out of bandwidth, and you just you can't tolerate it. And so I think that's why it's so, like, it, it always leads to a bad place. So if you want to be like a good negotiator, a good diplomat, you need to understand that people have an expectation of you and that you have an expe expectation of them and that when you get upset, it's often not because they did something wrong, which could be the case, but it could be that maybe your model is deficient. So I can't help you about getting upset, but I've started to become more aware of the times when I get really annoyed. So like uh, in Cape Town, people are like super flaky. This drove me nuts for a long time. I think it has something to do with the logistics of the city. Like in Joburg, everything's far apart. So you travel long distances to see someone. And if you do that and the party's off, you're not doing that again. You're no longer friends. But in Cape Town, there's so many opportunities. Like you don't have to commit to anything. Because you're like, oh my God, like here's another thing. You walk around. It's, you don't have to commit. And it drove me crazy organizing parties, um, but then I, like, I just started to do what everyone else did, which is just a double book, but to not confirm so hard on the second booking. <laughs> right, so <laughs> if things don't go the way you expect, it's not always the other person's fault. But if you're not amenable to changing your model, then you're not going to ever negotiate or broker a peace treaty. All right. So, like I said, I like this idea. I think there's value in exploring analogies in certain domains and seeing if they transfer at all to other domains. And I think one area that's been really prolific in having a universal practical applications has been signal processing and electrical engineering, which is my background, uh, and I think har harmonic analysis in particular. So I'd like to... Um, take you through a thought process where I asked myself, what are the most valuable inventions of our time and what would be the analog in a variety of domains? Maybe mechanical, maybe in computing or information. And aside from the wheel, I think that the telescope was super valuable because it allowed us to navigate the oceans, allowed us to explore the stars and start mapping the planets. And I asked myself, well, what is a telescope? Well, a telescope's actually kind of simple. It's just a big, long cylinder that blocks out the light, a filter, and a lens. Now, a lens is just something that focuses. It's an amplifier, a passive amplifier, but an amplifier nonetheless. And that is exactly what a, a sensor is. A sensor is a filter and an amplifier. And signal processing, oh, there's a lot of filters in there and a lot of amplification. So I thought, what else can I find? And incidentally, one of the sponsors for PyCon, Aruba, they build a Wi-Fi sensor. That's what it does. It just measures the Wi-Fi. It tells you if it's good or bad. Very valuable company. It got bought by, um, by HP or uh, Cape, Cape Networks. So electrical engineering, there are a few basic components. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, 
And the more uh, complex components, which are transistors and diodes, variable resistors are just a manual switch on top of a resistor. And I'd like to take you through each of these to see if we can find the, an analog. So a resistor is just a dump valve. It's something that can dissipate heat. Generally, it, it gets hot. And this is actually how most voltages are, are, are measured. Like, you, you, you dump some energy over there, and then you, you measure it. See how long it takes to cool down, essentially. So if you have 600 amps running through a line, like if this cable over here, you can't just cut that cable, man. How do you stop a truck? If a truck is coming at you, you need, you need something to absorb that kinetic energy. And that's what brakes are. They're a dump valve. So we have circuit breakers in electrical engineering, and they're just idealized switches that can, that can break 600 amps, and they get hot when they do this. They can only work a certain number of times. They're only rated for like 1,000 or 10,000 uh, breakages. Inductors are just coils of wire, and they are, uh, in the mechanical domain, they are a shock. So your car suspension has a spring and a shock inside of it. Inductors, they store uh, magnetic energy. And they don't, when current's flowing through them, they don't like it to stop. They'll, they'll make a, a, you'll see lightning when you try and cut them. And a diode, so diodes are a little bit more complex. They're also a passive component, but they have a non-linear behavior because they are a one-way valve. And you see this in, if you get a drip at the hospital, you don't want the blood going out, there's a valve in there. You have your fuel line in your car, there's a valve in there, a one-way valve. If you have a gas uh, cylinder, a pressure vessel, there's a, a little valve on top. And that, val that valve is actually a little bit more complicated. It's something called a regulator, and we'll get to that. And a capacitor is just a spring. It stores potential energy. And you can think of a capacitor as if you have a pipe filled with water, there's an elastic membrane, even though no water can pass through, because it is two plates, that may be rolled up in a cylinder, but it's still two plates, you can still get a signal across by stretching out the membrane forwards and backwards. And that's why alternating current can travel through a capacitor, but not DC. But when you do that, you invert the phase. And that's why you put an AC signal through a cap, uh, the phase is delayed by 180 degrees, I think. All right. You guys still with me? Okay, good. What happens when we compose these components? Let's take a resistor and a capacitor. It's called an RC circuit. What do we get? We get a low-pass filter. It only lets uh, low frequencies through. And there are also high-pass filters. And if you combine the two, you get a band-pass filter. The next more complex component is a transistor. Now you can think of a transistor as two, two diodes pointing at each other. Not quite accurate, but more or less. And a transistor is a little amplifier. It has three legs. One is called the collector, one is called the emitter, and the base or the gate. And if you bias the base and the emitter, like a, a relay or a gas relay, the, it will let the energy flow from the top all the way to the bottom. And so it can act as a, an amplifier. By biasing it more, it opens up the, the valve a little bit more. So transistors are amplifiers, but they have a switch, and you can turn the switch. So they're a switching amplifier. And I, was, I thought, what is the information equivalent of this in today's world? Well, we spend a lot of time on social networks, like Twitter and Facebook. I like Twitter. It's, a bit, it's like the water cooler of the galaxy. They are information amplifiers. When you say something, it just goes And what happens is you have this flood of information. You don't know what to do with it. You should probably need some filters. So when you have too much of something, you need to kind of regulate it. And so this is a voltage regulator, a really simple one. And it's just three components. It's a transistor, a diode, that's a specific diode called a Zener diode, and a resistor. But note that the base of the transistor is connected to its collector, so there's a bit of a feedback loop there. So this, what, if, what happens when we connect the output to the input? Something interesting happens there. And that's a voltage regulator. 
And on a, a pressure vessel, the valve on top is a regulator. And you'll hear this when the gas doesn't work properly, you're trying to cook something on the scuttle. Sometimes the regulator has gone. It essentially keeps the gas from flowing at a certain rate so it doesn't blow out the flame. Very common. All, every power supply that your laptop is connected to has something like this. So when you have too much information or too much audio in the audio domain, because I build audio control systems, you have this much pipe. These speakers next to me, they can, they're like rated at, I don't know, like 80 watt RMS. If you give them more than that, it'll clip. It sounds terrible. So what you do is you have this big signal. You just want to squish it into that pipe. And the thing that does that is called an audio compressor. And it comes at a cost, which is that it reduces the dynamic range of your signal. And you'll hear people complain about these over-compressed songs today compared to like Bob Marley, and, which had a lot of dynamic range. Now this, a lot of house music is just very loud. It fills most of the pipe most of the time. Important to note that they are non-linear. They don't, they don't work all the time, so they'll only kick in after it exceeds. So it goes from, like, it would have done this, and it just, does, just stays in the pipe. And it's not usually desirable, but it's better than blowing out your speaker or clipping. But if you have this much information, and you have this big of a screen to look at, you've got to squeeze it in there. And so I realized these companies' news feeds are not information amplifiers, they are information compressors. Of course, it's not as simple as an audio compressor. You have to choose, pick and choose between all the little bits of data and information and tweets, and then you rank order them and you display them. But I think thematically it's, it's the same thing. And I think you can think of search as on-demand topic curation. And curation become, always becomes more valuable when you have an increasingly noisy system where you just keep adding information. All of it may be interesting, but you just keep, can't keep track of it. And so cur the value of curation rises exponentially as um, you know, new art is added to the global catalog of music. Because when you bring out a new song, you're still competing with the Beatles. You know? And how are we doing on time? Still good. What's it? All right, so David Ricardo was an economist who... Even by his critics, this idea was hailed as a, as a good one. He coined the idea of comparative advantage. Essentially, you should focus on the thing that you can do most efficiently. And it's summarized in this quote, which is, a country may import corn in exchange for exporting manufactured commodities or goods, even if it could grow the corn for less. Why? Because when you do this, the guy you're importing corn from, let's say you're exporting iPhones, if he can't make iPhones, it's better for him to trade and it's better for you to trade. Because now you're valuable to each other, you're going to trade, you're less likely to get invaded. You want to maximize the cost of aggression. So if that person did want to take, your, take you down or cut off supply, well, now he's got to make his own iPhones. Or at least if he made them, maybe he'd have to make them more expensively. So it gives you maximum leverage in this big graph if you focus on the thing that you do most efficiently and trade. So how does this apply practically? Well, the best Formula One drivers, they don't just have great reaction time. They also gym really hard. They have to tolerate these G-forces. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you need to figure out what are the skills that give you maximum comparative advantage. And a lot of people will say public speaking, number one. You should learn public speaking, you should learn accounting, you should learn negotiation. And I think it's worth thinking about what the skills are for you, whatever domain you're interested in, whatever it is you're doing. If you're a musician, you should learn to sell because it's going to be tough. You know? <laughs> Actually, you should just start to program like <laughs> and do it on the side because you don't earn money making music. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. So the trick is to choose these skills that maximize your advantage. And I think it's a form of, of value investing. All right. So this one's a little bit out there. Imagine a graph. A graph so big, it doesn't fit in memory or on disk. 
It's so big and so bright, you can't even look at it without a telescope. You can just, it's over there, it's a burning ball of mass, and you want to go explore it because you know, you're a little bit afraid of it because you don't know what's in it, and maybe there's something valuable there. How do you go about it? So you kind of break it up in sectors, and you get a search party together, and you give them some rations, like, hey, Columbus, go explore sector 6C. And uh, he kind of hoped for the best. I mean, that's what they did when they went to explore the new world. And after a few years, some of the search parties in their areas, they got stuck in the loops inside the graph because they didn't have enough memory to even remember where they were. Some of them got eaten by bears. Some of them <laughs> returned with scars. They're like, dude, don't go in there. <laughs> you know, there are bears there. And some of them returned with great riches. And now you have to like, convey some information. And some will settle their own colonies and make that piece of the graph their own. And maybe you'll run into them, like call it Australia or something. So if you haven't figured out by now, this is a metaphor for the universe or all the domains of knowledge. And you can't hold it. Like You, you can't understand all of it. And I would argue that anything that could grasp a graph so big would have to stop time because the graph is a process happening. It's, it, things are moving. And if you stop time, you would have to be some, you'd have to be either outside the graph to even hold it, which means, well, now the graph's even bigger, uh, or you'd have to be like some kind of godlike figure. So I, I think, um, this is my opinion, but that, that, that's sufficient reason why you will always have multiple agents of consciousnesses. Because you just can't hold onto a graph that big. It will, it will slip out of your reach. So you always have these like factions. You'll always have islands. And you're going to need a lot of telescopes. So, KGB. in conclusion, what am I doing about all these like weird metaphysical ideas? Well, if you want to be a better negotiator, if you want to explore different territories, I think there are some things that you can do. I think there's a lot of undiscovered wealth, a lot of interesting ideas that you can go and explore in your domain. And I think today, like most people do not study statistics, and it underpins everything. Control system theory. If you go read like, the early control system theory stuff, a lot of the neural networks uh, came out of that. Chemistry, I know very little about it, and uh, been hearing some beautiful talks on radio astronomy, and I think there's, there's a lot to learn from those domains. You should try to maximize your comparative advantage as an individual, figure out what you're missing, and pick up the skills that would help you move between worlds, so to speak. And uh, specialize, you know, while being a diplomat, and try to facilitate trade between different factions, between different people, different companies. So like for me, my skin in the game is like, I'm working on multilingual chat apps for structured negotiation between borders because I've dealt with a little bit of import-export and it's very painful. So if you're like an import-export person or a clearing agent, please come talk to me. I'll be drinking beer at the chariots bar afterwards. You should try to be like, well, this is what... I can only tell you what I'm doing, really. And I think learning to write well, perform well, play an instrument, go perform, because it'll make you a better public speaker, it'll get comfortable on stage, and learn to negotiate. There's a lot of prior art on negotiation. It's usually filed under a bit of a bad word, like we don't like the word sales, but it is fundamentally, it's sales, it's selling. And a lot of selling is listening and understanding what other people want. And I had a great conversation with David Campy earlier about nonviolent communication. A big part of negotiation is telling people what you want and what you're willing to give. And if you can find a high-value trade, something that's valuable to me to receive but cheap to give, that's valuable to you to receive, that would be a good trade that maximized comparative advantage. I think there's a lot we can do in trying to invent different kinds of amplifiers, uh, different kinds of filters, seals to hold together the components that we'll be building in the future, and to build new kinds of sensors. 
and then to compose these into bigger things like compressors. And I only realized after the fact that, that this wallfly, wallfly thing I was working on is a remote dynamic audio compressor. <laughs> but it was something that I wanted because I perform live every week and the volume is always a, a mess up, you know. So some of the things that I'm doing, like, again, uh, I'm trying to get better at public speaking. I'm studying probabilistic graph databases. Like, I actually haven't seen one in the wild. Uh, I use graph databases a lot, uh, but I, I think given the amount of information we have to deal with, you have to move away from ones and zeros or integers into vector fields. You have to move into something a little bit more probabilistic because you don't even have enough disk space to store these graphs. Analog signal processing and harmonic analysis is huge. Like, it's, it's a really an unearthed domain. If you go uh, study filters and cross-correlation, I mean, it forms the basis for, for most of our statistics. And I would actually call electrical engineering, I would rename it to signal engineering because that is what it's more about. It's not just about electricity. And a probabilistic programming, which is very, very fringe still. I think it's way too early, but it's a good time to start learning about it. And constraint solvers have been around for a long time, but they're um, not very commonly applied, usually in routing algorithms or logistics. And uh, personally, things that I'm betting on, that I'm putting my money toward, has been uh, negotiation protocols. Like, I'm kind of betting on this edge idea that people will speak more different languages and that they're going to want a way to agree. Um, that we'll all have a distributed supercomputer on our wrist and that any neural networks that you're working on, try and get them to work on an embedded computer because there's a lot of stuff that you can do at the edge uh, that you'll want to do at the edge, which you can rely on the Google Cloud for. Uh, graph databases, some interesting, there are a bunch of them out there. The one I like is Day Datomic and more recently Crux. And yeah, that's it. Cool, so lastly, and I have to be very diplomatic here, uh, but I think okay, you should keep your identity small as an engineer because a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey man, what's your stack? What language do you use? You know? And I kind of, like man, if, if someone went up to like Schumacher or an experienced racing car driver and said, so uh, what brand of car do you drive? You know? Like, is that relevant? Like, what you need is, depends what you want. Do you want a rally driver? Do you want a Formula One driver? And so I would be very wary of tying your brand or your identity to a particular technology because you can hear that identity ideology spin up and I find it always gets in the way. And by the, while you're still arguing about ideology or what brand of car you should be driving, you might have missed something better that you could be using. Some new technology might have emerged. In closing, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making it possible for, for me to be here and hopefully entertain you guys and for putting on, on such a beautiful conference. Really appreciate it. And um, if you need someone to build a product for you, um, I am doing some freelancing at the moment to fund my endeavors. Those are my deets. And that's my shtick. That's all I got for you guys today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Petrus, for sharing um, some of your, well, where you are in your personal journey and your personal thoughts about how we navigate this increasingly specialized world um, where knowledge sort of is increasingly siloed and the silos are increasingly deeper. Um, I think we have time for just kind of one question while Adam is setting up. So if someone has a question, um, Dave has a mic. Hey, Petrus. Um, yes, uh, great, great talk. I found our discussions yesterday at the, um, at the bar very fun. Uh, what would you say to someone saying that this is a great way to navigate the world and uh, essentially see where you might find your max value? But what if you like where you are right now? And what if you enjoy where you are right now? If you understand what I mean. I can't quite hear you. Are you asking, what would I say to someone who says, this is how you should navigate the world? Well, essentially, you're saying, this is how you should navigate the world. And these are... Well, the, I don't know about that, but okay, yeah. Okay, and find the spot where you are at the map providing the maximum value, right? Okay. Okay, but maybe people don't want to find that spot 
and uh, maybe they're happy where they are right now. Maybe they want to continue doing what they are. That's fine. I'm not actually telling people what to do. I'm telling you what I'm doing. Uh, but if you want to f- make wealth and do valuable things for other people, this is a way of thinking about it. So I don't know, man. I don't, I don't like to tell people what, what to do. I'll tell them when they do something that annoy me because like, that gets in the way of me doing what I want. So it's sort of like a, n- a negative of that. Like, yeah. uh, you've heard this, uh, like the golden rule, which is like don't do, do unto others as you want done to yourself. But there's a better rule called the platinum rule, which is to treat people the way they want. But you don't know what they want. They don't even know what they want sometimes. So there's, there's an even better rule, and I forget what the name of it is. It's like the negative rule, which is like, don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. <laughs> okay, thanks again for the analogies. <laughs> My pleasure. It's been a pleasure, you guys. Thank you very much.